Welcome back to our class, Genesis, the Conflict Over Creation. We're glad that you joined us to study how to handle and carefully interpret the opening chapters of the book of Genesis. Our instructor is James Rochford. In this episode, we will evaluate the literary framework interpretation of Genesis 1. The literary framework interpretation dates back as far as 1924, though more recent proponents include Gordon J. Wenham, Meredith Glein, Henry Blochet, and Bruce Waltke. The literary framework view claims to be a historical account of creation. Meredith Glein writes this, he says, Genesis 1-11 through is not mythological, but a genuine record of history. The material in these chapters is unquestionably interpreted by inspired writers elsewhere in Scripture as historical in the same sense that they understand Genesis 12-50 through or Kings and the Gospels to be historical. However, this perspective holds that Genesis 1 is arranged around a literary framework. Thus, Genesis 1 explains God's creation topically, not sequentially or chronologically. Again, Klein writes this, The scheme of the creation week itself is a poetic figure, and the several pictures of creation history are set within the six workday frames, not chronologically, but topically. Henry Blochet goes so far as to say that, quote, chronology has no place here. What is this literary arrangement? Proponents of this view believe that Genesis 1-2 gives us the literary framework itself. There we read that the earth was formless and void. Thus, days 1-3 through deal with the formlessness of the earth, while days 4-6 through deal with the void or emptiness. Bruce Walke explains it in this way. He says the first triad days 1 through 3, separates the formless chaos into three static spheres. In the second triad, days 4 through 6, the spheres that house and shelter life are filled with the moving forms of sun, moon, and living creatures. The inhabitants of the second triad rule over the corresponding spheres. The sun and the moon rule the darkness, while humanity, head over everything, rules the earth. This perspective could be summarized as follows. Days 1 through 3 are days of forming, while days 4 through 6 are days of filling. Day 1, God distinguishes light from darkness, whereas day 4, God fills this void with the sun, the moon, and the stars. Day 2 also deals with the formlessness. God separates the waters, creating clouds, sea, and sky whereas day five, in a corresponding way, fills the clouds, sea, and sky with birds and fish. Likewise, day three corresponds to day six. Day three, God separates the land from the ocean, whereas day six, God fills the land with animals and humans. Advocates of this perspective further argue that literary devices show us that Genesis 1 shouldn't be read chronologically. Gordon Wenham notes that day 3 and 6 both have the expression, and God said, twice, showing some sort of parallelism between the two. Moreover, he notes that the first verse relates to the last verse of this section as well, both mentioning God, create, and the heavens and the earth. He also adds that we can detect literary devices in the use of the repeated formulae, the tendency to group words and phrases into tens and sevens, literary techniques such as chiasm and inclusio, the arrangement of creative acts into matching groups, and so on. Do proponents of the literary framework view teach theistic evolution? Some do, and some don't. Henry Blochet notes that this interpretation relieves the tension of harmonizing science with scripture. However, he rightly warns that this could constitute a temptation 
to squeeze the text into an evolutionary perspective. Blochet argues that the interpretation of the text takes supremacy over our interpretation of science and not vice versa. Meredith Klein firmly rejected theistic evolution, holding to a special creation of Adam. In Genesis 2, he believed that the literary framework moves to a more straightforward historical chronology. Therefore, special creation is in view from his perspective. He writes this, The creature thus animated was not previously alive, and it was nothing short of man, the image of God, that now by this immediate divine action first became a living being. And he cites 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Paul, he writes, understood this record of the woman's origins as straightforward history. Following that direction in the exegesis or the interpretation of Genesis 2-7 particularly, we find ourselves led away from any theoretical reconstruction in which the creative act that produced Adam is attached organically to some prior life process evolving at a subhuman level. Old Testament scholar Bruce Waltke, on the other hand, believes that the literary framework interpretation does allow for theistic evolution. He contends that scripture and science are simply answering two different sets of questions, and therefore they do not conflict with one another at all. In his recent work in 2011, his book entitled An Old Testament Theology, Waltke writes this, the best harmonious synthesis of the special revelation of the Bible and of science is the theory of theistic evolution. He writes that the only direct creation was giving Adam his image and spiritual component. Advocates of the literary framework view do not believe that the details of the narrative are important. Instead, the purpose is that God is the creator. As Walke writes, the narrator's concern is not scientific or historical, but wishes clearly to establish that it is God who has created all and who has dominion over all, including the seas, sun, and moon. He explains that the purpose of the creation account is so that we can imitate the creator's work. His purpose is merely to show that God created the earth and that it is all very orderly. Furthermore, the creation week exists for the purpose of explaining the Sabbath in Exodus chapter 20. Well, the literary framework interpretation is not without its criticisms. For one, the use of the Vav consecutive implies historical prose narrative. The repetition of this Hebrew literary device, and God said, and it was so, and so forth, implies historical prose and a succession or sequence of chronological events. This makes the Hebrew verbs in the va yiktal tense by adding a vav to the beginning. This verbal form describes a succession of past events. It expresses actions, events, or states which are to be regarded as the temporal or logical sequel of actions, events, or states mentioned immediately before. The ordinary usage of this grammatical form in narrative is to denote discrete and basically sequential events with the progression of numbered days. This strongly implies a chronological progression, not a topical arrangement. Second, Exodus 20 verse 11 and Exodus 31, 16 and 17 both imply a creation week of some kind, not a topical arrangement. The literary framework view collapses the creation week from six days into three. If the creation week is supposed to be a pattern of some kind for us to follow, then what pattern is it, if these are supposed to be topically linked with one another? Third, the literary framework view favors poetic devices over historical narrative. Genesis, as we have argued, is history, that is, the events actually occurred. It is not in the genre of poetry. Edward J. Young writes this, Genesis 1 is written in exalted, semi-poetical language. Nevertheless, it is not poetry. 
For one thing, the characteristics of Hebrew poetry are lacking, and in particular, there is an absence of parallelism. Advocates of the literary framework view argue that the Gospel of Matthew is fully historical, and yet it does not portray the life of Jesus chronologically. Instead, it portrays it topically. For instance, Matthew compresses many of Jesus' miracles in chapters 8 and 9, whereas the other Gospels arrange these in a different order. Furthermore, at certain points, Luke may have written his Gospel with a logical structure rather than a chronological ordering. Other non-chronological passages abound in Scripture. However, these authors use a topical arrangement without implying any literary framework. So, when Matthew does use a literary framework in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, it still implies a chronology. We recognize that Matthew has a schematic arrangement, but that does not mean that he has thrown chronology to the winds. Why then must we conclude that, merely because of a schematic arrangement, Moses has disposed of chronology? This is a good point from Edward J. Young. In Matthew chapter 1, Matthew arranges Jesus' genealogy with 14 generations from the beginning of Abraham to David, and then 14 generations from David to the exile, and 14 generations from the exile to Jesus himself. And yet, even though there is a schematic in this genealogy, we still would view it as chronological, not poetic. Fourth, the parallels between the days do not always line up. If similarities argue for a topical reading between days 1 and 3, 2 and 5, and 3 and 6, then dissimilarities should be evidence against such a reading. Consider just a few examples of the dissimilarities in this framework view. Genesis refers to the creation of the expanse five times on day two, and it mentions the expanse on day four. The sun, the moon, and the stars of day four fill the expanse of day two. Now, given the literary framework view, we would expect the creation of the expanse on day one, which would relate to day four, not on day two. Consider another example. Genesis refers to the seas on day three, and the fish fill the seas on day five. These are later called the fish of the sea in Genesis 1, 26 and 28. But again, if the literary framework view was true, we would expect the seas to be created on day two, not on day three in order to correspond to the fish of the seas on day five. Finally, Genesis refers to the creation of the seas on day three. However, nothing created on day six fills the seas. In conclusion, we believe that we should distinguish between a bad view and a false view. We agree with Wayne Grudem, who writes that the literary framework view does not deny the truthfulness of Scripture, However, it adopts an interpretation which, upon closer inspection, seems highly unlikely. We would agree with this assessment. While we don't believe that this view is true, we would affirm that it's a possible interpretation of Genesis. At least it's attempting to ground itself in the text. Furthermore, we would point out that there is something to be said about some kind of a framework, yet in our estimation we think that this is completely overblown. So while the literary framework view is a possible view, we simply don't find it compelling whatsoever.